Hello and a very warm welcome to today's ISNTD Connect webinar. Um, thank you very much for tuning in. Today it's my uh, greatest pleasure to welcome Dr. Alvaro Acosta Serrano to join us today to speak about uh, recent research, uh, quite exciting research in cutaneous leishmaniasis. So today, uh, Dr. Acosta um, Serrano, you're going to speak to us about some recent work that you've done looking at the role of skin microbiota uh, and the relationship of that with um, anti leishmania treatments. Thank you very much, Marianne, and, and, and a real apologies uh, to you again and, and everyone who may be listening from all over the world. Uh, I'm not sure what happened. So the way we think this is going to work is by uh, Marianne kindly project uh, put this slide for me because we couldn't uh, get it to work from my own uh, laptop. Okay, so um, thank you again for, for this invitation. And um, I'm trying to, to talk about something that we have been working for some time. That's part of a Leishmaniasis program that have been uh, working for almost a decade um, here at the School of Tropical Medicine in Liverpool. So next slide, please. So a lot of people uh, know me because of my work with uh, trypanosomes and tsetse flies. This is more a fundamental aspect of uh, what we do here in Liverpool. Um, when Marianne first contacted me, she, she wanted me to, to speak about this, uh, but I thought uh, for the ISNTD community, it would be better to talk about something more uh, translational. So that's what I decided to talk about leishmaniasis. And if, uh, next slide, if anyone is interested in, in uh, looking into what we're doing in relation to the basic biology of trypanosomes and tsetse flies, here are some uh, publications and uh, that you can uh, have a look at. So next slide, please. So the, the main question is, is here. So we've been um, looking into all world cutaneous leishmaniasis uh, with great collaborators in Saudi Arabia. And the main, the main question is um, we were, um, a part of a group looking into reassessing how can we uh, uh, eliminate cutaneous leishmaniasis from um, at least from Saudi Arabia for the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And one of the aspects that um, we were looking into it was to uh, assess, reassess how the treatment, uh, anti leishmania drug treatment was working. And when uh, we were looking into this, we observed that um, there is a, a massive differential response to treatment depending on if the patient is uh, developed secondary infections in the lesions, okay? So in this particular case, for example, this patient <clears throat> you see on, on your left, you see this patient had uh, multiple serial lesions. Um, the, the doctors didn't know what, what actually this patient had. They, had, they thought he had a, a, a massive bacterial infection. It was treated with uh, antibiotics and nothing happened. It was treated with um, uh, antimonials, which is the, the main drug that's been used uh, to treat all well cutaneous leishmaniasis, <clears throat> and nothing happened. And only when there was a, a consecutive treatment of antibiotics and antifungals followed by antimonials is that after several months, that patient got the ulcer heal. So that is telling us that, um, so this is this is not necessarily um, unresponsive due to um, uh, the parasite getting resistant to the drug treatment. This is uh, the patient become unresponsive to treatment due uh, uh, in principle to secondary infections. And so the question is whether this ulcer microbiome is in somehow modulating the anti leishmania treatment response. So next slide, please. So um, just next slide, please. And just quickly, for those who are not familiar with leishmaniasis, this is a worldwide problem. Okay, we have it in the in the in the new and uh, in the old world. And um, this is the next slide. The the result that the, how the disease manifests is, is just this fascinating spectrum of different uh, cutaneous um, um, clinical presentations that goes into just a single ulcer that may heal. And, and, and then the patient never sees it again or may come back if the patient is immuno, somehow immunocompromised or immunosuppressed, or it can go in a form of diffuse cutaneous or, 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 or could also metastasize to form a uh, mucocutaneous uh, condition as well. Um, these three conditions are, are not fatal, but uh, they, they pose a problem into mental health, and I will talk about this in a minute. And then we go to the, the visual form that, that is uh, fatal if untreated. 
Next, please. So in the old world, um, uh, now I'm going to be focusing into container leishmaniasis, um, and, and particularly what we see in, in Saudi Arabia, um, the, the disease is caused by basically two leishmania species, tropica and major. Um, they have different <clears throat> vectors, and they also have different cycles. One, one is anthropognotic, and the other one is zoonotic. And they are very, very well divided geographically. So um, most of the, in leishmaniasis clinics, the specialist, the dermatologist, is able to assess or, or diagnose based on the, um, how uh, the appearance of the ulcer, but also dependent on the geographical regions. This is perfect in a scenario where everything is divided geographically, but then the problem is what is human displacement, when that is this mix of uh, 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 people with different infections that it becomes very challenging for the dermatologist to diagnose. Next slide, please. And the problem with this is, um, although it's not a fatal condition, obviously, it leads to a series of problems with the stigma and mental health problems. And, and that is something that is very uh, um, overlooked uh, over years. One main problem is that there is no molecular diagnostics to detect the disease on time. And a lot of the drugs don't work, don't work either because of there is drug resistance involved or because the patient becomes unresponsive. What are the consequences of this? The longer it takes to, uh, to heal, the chances, uh, the higher are the chances to develop scarring, and then that leads to all these uh, uh, social problems and, and include mental problems as well. Uh, next, please. So um, in, in this regard, and in a collaboration with uh, several um, colleagues, including uh, David Molyneux, um, we, we came out with these um, um, suggestion of a recalculation and, and how we can um, uh, estimate the impact that cutaneous leishmaniasis has worldwide. And in this sense, uh, we advocate, and I don't have time to explain to the, this, but I advocate that leishmaniasis should be taken as an active when the ulcer is still open and, and the patient may be healing or not, or inactive when the scarring has happened. And if we look into this, that changes completely the perception in terms of impact prevalence and therefore the, the recalculating DALIs. So by doing this and doing a, a conservative estimation, we come out with this uh, magic number of at least 40 million people worldwide will be suffering oleishmaniasis at different levels of the uh, infection. Next, please. So, and, and, and in, in, in relation to this, and there is a, a, an initiative by colleagues at, at, at Kidd University. This is led, uh, co-led by Dr. Helen Price and Professor Lisa and the committees. They, uh, um, and some colleagues from, from several countries, they, they, uh, they funded Eclipse. Eclipse is a project that looks exactly into the aspects of uh, intervention and stigma. And so I would suggest to watch out into the developments and of this uh, very original and, and project that, that deals exactly with this with this issue. Next, please. So, container leishmaniasis, um, worldwide and mainly in the in the um, in the old world, is uh, completely correlated with conflict and civil unrest. And and we can see uh, very well that um, in in. Uh, Iraqi and and um, in Iraq and the Afghanistan war. Um, that's that's um, that's uh, one major factor that, that triggered this uh, massive uh, uh, hyperendemic uh, status of cutaneous maniasis in, in the past. Perhaps Afghanistan continues to be the country with the highest uh, incidence of cutaneous maniasis worldwide. Uh, next, please. And, but then, obviously, the Syrian crisis is another uh, big example, and specifically the area that was uh, uh, badly affected, uh, which is Aleppo, is always been endemic for Leishmania tropica. And um, what happens in this uh, conflict situation? Well, that led to this massive human displacement um, in, you know, in the region, but also um, in other um, European countries. And, and, and that obviously, um, then after that became relocation into different uh, refugee camps um, uh, located uh, around Syria, mainly in, in, in southern Turkey. And, and that obviously has led to uh, uh, trigger many, many uh, cases that is very difficult to estimate during, during wartime. Um, but, uh, you know, this is uh, hand by hand, one of the consequences of uh, a conflict 
is the dispersion of catalytic analysis in, in those endemic areas. Next, please. We were able to, um, with Walid Al Salem, when he was a, a, a student uh, within my group, he was able to uh, map out in, in a very uh, general way uh, where this human uh, movement was uh, occurring in relation to uh, the refugee camps in panel A and in panel B on all the uh, uh, sunfly species and parasite species that are around. Um, and so sort of a way to predict that um, this um, uh, uh, epidemic will, will, will continue, will expand through the region as well. Uh, next, please. And, and obviously, those are some um, challenges for the health system of many, uh, many countries uh, um, affected by and directly by, by these uh, displacement and next, and uh, including Syria and others. Uh, so we're uh, sorry, including um, the Lebanon and those who were uh, worked on in collaboration with uh, Dima Al Safadi, and where we're looking into the possible reintroduction, possible reintroduction of cutaneous uh, humanizers into the country. Next, please. So um, there are several ways that obviously in the ideal world, we don't have a vaccine that will uh, prevent the disease or, or be able to treat it. But um, leishmaniasis in principle is a, is a condition, is a disease that um, with a little bit of a conditions, we can um, deal with it. And, and, and that problem linked to uh, war or similar unrest and, and poverty is what is being limiting um the the um, efficacy of uh, elimination in, in in some areas okay so looking into this so next slide please uh, we had a, a within my group these uh, um, 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 for several years a group of very talented people at different levels phd students and postdocs looking into different aspects of acutane uh, analysis and we were um in partnership with the saudi minister of health uh, trying to reassess what the problem was um, in, in the whole kingdom and also come out with some solutions. So we were um, basically dealing with three main aspects of these programs. Next, please. So one was diagnostics, and, uh, and, uh, and, I, and I mentioned before that um, to our surprise, there was two non-molecular uh, diagnostics being applied. Um, which is probably fine in, in a specific geographical areas as I explained into the zoonotic and the anthroponotic cycle of disease. But when um, in, in refugee camps on, on in situation with the human displacement, it's very challenging. So we're looking into, uh, looking into some uh, antibody responses against uh, um, sugar epitopes that recognize a parasite. And uh, next please, and the, the challenge for the dermatology is like, if you look at the, all these different pictures, um, only the top ones are related to and or caused by cutaneous leishmaniasis, where you see the other skin conditions um, that as some of them resemble, where you see cutaneous leishmaniasis is very challenging for the dermatologist to come out with diagnostics. So um, that's what we thought diagnostic would be an important issue to deal with. Next, please. So this, and, and on the right, you see, um, so we collaborated with Professor Kate Michael and Professor Igor Almeida from the University of Texas at El Paso. And um, they are um, expert in, in, in glycochemistry and they uh, synthesize some of these epitopes that uh, we, in principle, we're looking into we're validating using just ELISA, ELISA tests, but then we'll be looking into making some RDTs. Next. So um, um, after this, we, we thought that also we concentrate into um, um, using some um, biting exposure markers. And what I, what, I, what I mean with this is that using antigenic um, antigens from uh, vector from sunfly saliva that we know that are very antigenic and, and in, in for humans, and we can use them to to, to tell whether uh, an intervention to eliminate local sunflies in a given population is working or not. This is uh, one of the fascinating aspects of into this research, not much explored into um, uh, vector bone diseases in general, uh, but these, um, the logic behind this is that um, we, in endemic areas, we get beaten all the time by insects and, and obviously salivary proteins and some of the molecules are highly antigenic. We develop that uh, immune response. And then um, how do we know our intervention is working? So next, please. 
So this uh, antibody response is seasonal, so you can see here on, on, the, on the right side. So <clears throat> when, these, uh, when we get heavily exposed to the bite, we develop antibodies. When there is an intervention, in principle, we, those, those antibody levels should drop. And, and, but if it doesn't drop, then it means that intervention is not working. So that's a, a good way that, um, that complements very well the entomological assessment, whether uh, an intervention for vector control is working in a, in a given area. So next, so we, we work on that, and um, we, we collaborated with uh, the lab of Jesus Valenzuela, who uh, kindly supplies some of the markers for Philobotinus papatase, which is the vector of Lichmann major. And uh, we can see, for example, in this particular paper that uh, what we call locals, so those are Saudi uh, locals, and they are get less exposed to non-locals migrant workers uh, that are, in, for example, in the construction sector or working in farms. So they have high antibody levels. And in B, you see that they get, they tend to have a more uh, severe uh, leishmaniasis as a result of that exposure. Next, please. And um, next. So <clears throat> the next aspect was to look into uh, treatment response. And um, this, that was part of uh, um, uh, Salid al was uh, uh, Walid al Salen when he was uh, uh, in my lab, and um, Walid came back to the to the kingdom, and and and, and because he was linked to the Ministry of Health, he 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 was head of the entities for a while, and now is a consultant to the Deputy Minister at the South Minister of Health, and and with all his knowledge into leishmaniasis control. He has some interesting observation that uh, has led to this work. And one of those is in relation to how the treatment responds varies depending on the parasite species, the geographical, mm -hmm. geographical location, and the presence or not of secondary infections. Next, please. And uh, just to explain a little bit more into, into that uh, uh, work, um, so he, he mapped out um, um, the, the uh, or make an assessment uh, of the uh, epidemiological assessment of the different species of leishmania within the kingdom, and also uh, look into the treatment response, response treatment responses in those different patients, where we have in the, in the blue square all that have responded very well, as so a sensitive, um, in in red you see them responsive, and in uh, you can see areas where you have a combination of patients that are highly responsive or not to this treatment. So uh, next, please. And, and the way the uh, um, uh, in the kingdom is is is, is being treated is uh, in most places um, the the doctors they tend to supply first a combination of ochozalon uh, azoles so in A that's where you see in A on, on the on the left hand side uh, different azoles azoles uh, um, the uh, antifungals but also um, the the same pathway that affects the lipid pathway that affects in fungus is present in Leishmania, and, and uh, a, a, these antifungals, in principle, also should uh, or, or may also affect um, the Leishmania infection if it's present. Uh, fusidic acid, topical fusidic acid, is also uh, supplied, as I said, because this, uh, 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 a lot of these inf infections are prone to develop bacterial or secondary infections as well. And depending on this, then the doctor assess whether um, um, antimonials are supplied or not. Okay, so next, please. And um, you can see some, some of the uh, uh, typical uh, different presentations. So we compared to areas, uh, he compared to areas Al Hassa and Azir in the, in the south. Um, Al Hassa is sea level, is um, is uh, the cycle is is more zoonotic and is uh, L major and typical L major. Uh, we have multiple lesions and uh, and 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 it could be a mostly village manasses. On the other hand, a lot of people have heal. And then uh, in El Tropica, more into the um, southwest lesions of the region of the country, you see an infection by El Tropica. El Tropica tend to be one or two, three uh, lesions uh, in the patient, but it's very hard to treat. Not even antimonials uh, work very well. We, we come back to this. Next, please. So um, <clears throat> this is a sort of a, a schematic into what is being uh, done uh, uh, for our studies as well. We just follow the recommendation by the Southern Minister of Health. And what you can see is basically there are different protocols where uh, I just mentioned, went through the, the, uh, the order of this treatment. And 
if the, pa the, the patients, uh, a lot of time we chose antifolgal antibiotics, or you see in, in T1 on the left, is, is enough to, uh, for the patient to, 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 to trigger healing. Um, but sometimes they become unresponsive, and, and then they may need uh, multiple um, courses of uh, intralesional uh, antimonials. And if they don't respond to these courses, then they go to intramuscular. So it's, it's, it's quite actually harsh and severe uh, treatment. SI means for secondary infections, and, um, and a lot of time uh, the, the, they are visible or not. And, and the doctors decide right away that the patient is not responding, so they go straight into the antimonials. In B. foliage manatropica, um, it doesn't matter whether there is a visible or detectable secondary infections, you just go straight and, and supply antimonial, which are very, in anywhere, not necessarily the most effective treatment. And then it might be combined with alternative, depending on uh, um, accessibility of some, some techniques like a cryon a thermotherapy. Uh, next, please. So just in a, in a nutshell, uh, depending on the region, what, what it observe is that um, in some regions, uh, patients just with uh, um, application of uh, azoles and fusilic acid is enough to, tr to trigger healing. Less, for example, in the center part of the country, but then in the Northwest, which is also affected by L major, then there is a great deal of patients that are unresponsive. That, that's what it means that uh, you are. And then in, in, in the Southwest, uh, which is uh, exclusively tropical infection, we can see that uh, uh, most of the patients are unresponsive. Next, please. So um, there are many factors that we can think about treatment failure, okay? And, and, and the main one in red highlighted is, is drug resistance. But um, there are one of the things that we wanted to then and emphasize is uh, what it might be the role of skin microbiota into this. Next, please. So, um, and, and when, when I mean the skin microbiota, we all know that obviously we have a microbial ecology on the skin and, and that uh, dictate obviously and also could be a, a reflection of whether an immunity is working or not. Some more people are prone to have some skin conditions, uh, eczema, et cetera, that, um, that are a result or modify the, the whole macromion, okay? So when we look into, we'll say skin microbiota may be modulating some of these infections. So within that homeostasis, um, um, when there is an infection, for example, by uh, Leishmania, then it completely alters this uh, balance. And then uh, that may bias for a specific type of bacteria or fungi. And, and then that's what I would actually try to understand within that uh, microbial ecology. So next, please. And, and just a simple graph indicating, for example, and in comparing El Major and Tropica, when there is secondary infection, there is no secondary infection in El Major, there are huge differences in treatment response, whereas in El Tropica, it doesn't seem to make a difference, okay? So in order to do this, um, Yasser Al Rey, who used to be a PhD student in my lab until last year, and now he's an assistant professor at King College University, he decided to look into more details of the macro macrobiome of these two group of patients. Next, please. And um, again, he can come back to the same uh, sort of area. So he, he took samples from Al Hasa, which is again uh, endemic for El Major, and uh, from Nazir, which is endemic for El Tropica. Uh, next, please. And um, something that is important to take into consideration are all, all sort of factors, including um, what a kind of a job these people that are affected by leishmaniasis have. And, and in Azir, the, the, main, the main people affected by leishmaniasis are, uh, are basically um, uh, people just living in, in their own residences. And, and uh, the students and, and few percentage of, for example, construction workers and drivers, whereas in Alhasa, which is a, a constant development and there are more oil fields around and there are a lot of day farms, most of the workers are, um, are exposed to those endemic areas. And, and it's not surprising in the next slide that we can see the demographics, uh, the, all the different uh, nationalities and other people, um, in, at least in our cohort, but that, that's, that's kind of uh, what happens normally. And there is a great deal of, uh, of the workforce in, in, the, in Saudi Arabia um, are uh, coming from uh, migrant workers. 
and and those people are um, when they take jobs in in farms and, and construction um, and the construction sector, then and they get unfortunately exposed and susceptible to this infection. So that contrasts very much to what we saw in Azir. In Azir is, is exclusively uh, local Saudis, whereas in Al Hasa, for example, most of the people affected by gutenrichmanisis are these uh, migrant workers. Next, please. So, um, so we took uh, he took uh, some swaps, and from um, healthy skin, and also from directive from the uh, the borders of the ulcer. And next, please. Next slide, please. And he started analyzing and looking into um, uh, several aspects of this. So, for example, uh, when we look into the parasite loads, comparing El major lesions with their tropical lesions, we can see that um, there is a, um, a higher number of parasites per lesion in, in, in El major when, when the disease actually uh, takes over. That kind of uh, um, parasite load tends to um, drop one, what is what if you see in panel B, for example, in the second visit, that's the second visit to the Leishmaniasis clinic, already under treatment, uh, you can see that right away some some of the patients, um, or most of the patients, that uh, parasite load tend to drop. Uh, next, please. So he he, um, he took some samples. Um, he processed these uh, um, swabs here in Liverpool, and then. Um, I submitted uh, the samples to the uh, Genomic Center and uh, the University of Liverpool and did some 16S metagenomic analysis uh, comparing uh, healthy and, and also um, uh, tissue from the different ulcers. And, and this is uh, obviously in the whole universe and very uh, uh, difficult to uh, pinpoint in, in a few minutes. Um, macrobiota, for, for obvious reasons, I think everyone would, would be uh, is uh, already know that um, it changes obviously depending on, on the what places in, a, in our body, and 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 obviously when when in disease conditions, then that uh, there are some some significant changes. So let's see what the changes and the main main changes are. Um, so there are um, obviously in the in the outside. In, uh, w in the previous slide, which is exactly the same thing we we're pointing out in Alhaza, uh, the differences in between the healthy and lesions in the different uh, part of the body that we uh, analyze, and then this is just showing up um, what happens, the differences between uh, health and lesions in just this pie chart in a very gross way. Okay, so but let's look this into more detail. Next, please. So um, what we look into, for example. Um, uh, one thing that we were looking into is the bacterial diversity, and we're comparing during the infection of Tropica and Major. So, in, in, in the case, for example, at Tropica and Major, we can see that when we compare um, healthy and 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 the uh, and the infected um, uh, tissues, we can see right away that is a, um, a difference in bacterial diversity, which is more noticeable in L Major uh, infection. So, next, please. And when we look into uh, different cases, so remember AF is the first line of treatment, then goes into additional injections and then intramuscular injection. And we can see that, um, I don't, I'm not sure you can see very well this, but uh, those are different pa parts and we compare, for example, the you know, hand, uh, feet and et cetera. So there, there are some um, um, so people who already heal with just AF, they have uh, a high diversity of uh, different bacteria population. This is a take on message. If you start looking into intralational injection, this is the group of patients who needed then uh, several, one or two courses of intralational injection, you start to see in turn what is called dysbiosis. And what I mean with dysbiosis is this is unbalance of bacterial population that leads to necessarily the, the colonization of a specific group of bacteria. Typically, those are opportunistic pathogens. We're talking about Staphylococcus, we're talking about Pseudomonas or Streptococcus, okay? But you can see, for example, um, what is in, in uh, circle in red, that uh, this biosis start to be seen in patients treated with in, in transitional injections, will be going to intramuscular, that this biosis tend to be more frequent. So it's already thinking, th telling us a message that um, this uh, diversity is, is associated with uh, early healing, and specifically with people that are submitted just only 
to azole and fusidic acid treatment, whereas at people that are harder to treat, either by intralesional or intramuscular injections, they tend to have to, to undergo more into dysbiosis compared to the fast responders. Next, please. And if we look into um, so um, different um, uh, patients, so we can see, okay, so is, is the, the question here is whether this dysbiosis comes necessarily before or is a reflection of the, just the normal skin microbiota of the patient. And you can see in some cases that um, uh, that's not, doesn't seem to be the case, okay? So uh, H means um, uh, healthy, L for lesions, and we can see in the different red squares that um, there is dysbiosis in the, um, in the infected tissues, but not necessarily in the healthy skin from the very same patient. And, and, and then in the next slide, you can see that uh, whoever some of the patients, there seems to be a carbon copy. So the, either the healthy or the or the lesion, there seems to be uh, dysbiosis already undergoing. So um, we need eager know patients to draw some conclusions. We can see both cases happening, um, in, and when we analyze uh, where the dysbiosis may originate. Uh, next, please. So um, when we compare then um, uh, Almayor and El Tropica uh, also, then we can see that, uh, again, there is a, a higher diversity in Almayor compared to Tropica. We know already Tropica is very, very hard to treat. It's very difficult. Uh, we couldn't get a specific uh, Tropica samples to compare alongside in the longitudinal studies we did with uh, El Major, but it's already correlating what we observe in El, in El Major uh, patients that are very hard to treat. So the Tropica is already less diverse, and they tend to be more of this biosis than uh, com compared to the um, uh, El Major patients. Next, please. Um, some of these observations have been um, done already and, and, and fantastic work. This is one example uh, by the lab of Phil Scott and Lisa, Elizabeth Grace. And, and we can see that um, what they, they found is uh, this biotic um, uh, skin in relation to Lishman infection. Uh, what is not uh, what is normally in our work is in relation to how does that may how that may play a role into uh, the response to treatment or not. Okay. So um, um, a lot of work already has been done uh, by this group, and and um, and, uh, and I thought it was important to acknowledge this. So, next, please. So what happens when and then we see longitudinal study? And so we know that on the on the right uh, on the on the left on the on the right panel we see the sequence again zero one two when when a patient uh, for example uh, uh, heals right away just by application antifungal antibiotics or the heals after the intralesional, which is number one, or just uh, uh, achieve healing in number two. And we, then when we see the score plot on the left, you see that then that correlates very well with diversity. So we see that in red, the, the high diversity correlates exactly with the uh, those patients that are the fast responders, where we start to see these um, uh, outliers um, um, signals uh, that correspond to patients that are, are very difficult to treat and that, are, and that again, that, have, that are, are much lower into microbial diversity. So next, please. So, and the, we can see also that and into the Shannon index, uh, very well represented. Again, in red and on the left, you see the, uh, uh, the first line of treatment. Second is just in traditional, in the middle one in blue. And then in gray, we go the, uh, um, the intramuscular, and what we can see here, is that uh, diversity goes down, but also important to point out here is that for those that are very difficult to treat, for example, in the first group, you see that those dysbiotic people, they have a, a, a predisposition of getting a streptococcus and some other type of bacteria, for example, whereas in the middle group is just staphylococcus, and then um, the, the, the most difficult to treat, we got a combination of pseudomonas, staphylococcus, and environmental plant bacteria, which is Arrhenia, which we don't know whether it's related to, to necessarily disease, but uh, this is uh, uh, something that is important to mention. So next, please. Okay, so uh, next. So we also did uh, uh, an impo important component of, of our skin microbiome is also 
what what can you tell can we tell us about the uh, uh, the population of fungi on on the skin and next please so 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 um yasser did uh, 18s um um analysis and the take-home message of this is that uh, when we look into the infections individually by Almeida and Tropica, we don't see major differences between non-lesions and lesions. We see basically the same diversity of uh, uh, fungal diversity between the two groups. So we don't see necessarily any imbalance we, 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 uh, um, between the two groups, but this is something that we're looking into uh, in more detail. Next, please. So um, obviously, with the uh, um, um, looking into the areas of potential uh, environmental bacteria in relation to disease, and this this uh, very nice paper coming from uh, um, uh, Jesus Valenzuela and Shannon Canhawe's lab, where we're looking into that uh, uh, bacteria that is uh, uh, related to visceralization of Lechman infantum um, during transmission. That um, uh, bacteria is involved in activation of the inflammasome, and when bacteria is removed, then, then there is no visceralization, there is no disease. This is sort of uh, the uh, big take of message. And, and uh, we were, uh, because we found some of the environmental uh, bacteria species in our sample, we were looking into, uh, we were wondering whether uh, also in the case of uh, L major transmission uh, by Prevalentus papadasi, for example, there will be some uh, uh, Migot uh, bacteria that might be uh, uh, related to disease severity. And, and next, just to summarize this, so we compare um, the uh, macrobiota, so next slide, please, of uh, our uh, Papatasi colony compared to uh, the um, some of the samples that uh, Yasser took directly from the same endemic areas when he analyzed macrobiota uh, from the patient macrobiota directly. Um, this is very complex. We didn't see anything specifically that was ringing a bell, okay? And um, just wanted to point out that when we look into and we compare the microbiota of uh, colonies and flies versus the, all these wild catches, it is quite different, okay? So we have to be extremely careful when we uh, assume on, on any potential function in, in terms of disease transmission, at least. Uh, by assigning the macrobiota for what we see in colony flies compared to what we see in the field. So next one, and I think I can probably wrap up now. So next. So um, during these uh, 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 questions, and you're taking these uh, a graph from, from a fantastic review, so we see that uh, obviously uh, the a transmission of Lichmania uh, by some flies, and we see in panel B, um, it disturbs these uh, 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 microbial ecology, uh, and, and, and that could lead to several, you know, outcomes. Um, and whether this, one of those could be dysbiosis, but whether dysbiosis precedes and facilitates Lichman infection and makes it harder to treat, we, we don't know. Okay, so next slide, please. So um, some of the major take on message of this, okay, so Lichman major treatment response appears to be modulated by the skin microbiota. The um, high bacterial richness and diversity is associated with healing. Um, so we wonder whether self-healing in H. major patients is associated with the type of diversity of microbiota that is present at a given time. And, and, and ob the obvious question, how can we exploit the skin microbiota for uh, disease biomarker and for design a better treatment um, um, for this condition? The study is far from perfect in the way that there were several challenges in, in, in the in, on the way. Uh, we, we couldn't, for logistic reasons, to get samples to look at the uh, uh, in new uh, markers of uh, some of these patients. We would have loved to look into um, and analyze the genomes and looking for potential uh, drug resistant marking in some of the, the parasites. Um, but, but we were unable to, to do this. But um, this is a, um, a good indication that something is going on in relation to um, um, treatment response that may not have anything to do with um, the, the parasite intrinsic properties to, to become resistant to drug, but something that is more complex, but could, could, could actually bring some hope in terms of uh, improving treatment. So next. Um, this is just to mention um, uh, many collaborators and, and all this uh, fascinating work. 
uh, um, and obviously Yasser and, and, and Walid uh, who have been a, a, a play a play a major role in into this. Up to acknowledge also the uh, the very generous uh, grants from um, Geneva Global and the National Philanthropic uh, Trust UK, Chef Font, and the, the collaborators at the Southern Minister of Health, and many other collaborators. And and next slides just to. Uh, Thank you, and um, happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Alvaro. Um, thanks so much for um, introducing to us and describing this extraordinary research. Um, and also, in addition to that, the, the huge amount of collaborations and multidisciplinary partnerships that um, you've been involved in leading up to this. Um, that, that's been uh, very, really amazing. Thank you so much, uh, Alvaro, and uh, lots of thank yous on the chat from all our attendees as well, probably many familiar um, names, co-authors, collaborators, also many friends. Um, so thanks again for, for your time on this. Um, this has given us obviously a lot of food for thought, and uh, there were a few already a few conversations going on uh, on the chat while you were uh, speaking. And uh, also, we've got quite a few questions for you. Um, so first and foremost, uh, we just had, it's actually a, just a reminder, a comment. I just wanted to say thank you to Chandrakant Ravankar. Uh, Chandrakant was just reminding us that uh, cutaneous les leishmaniasis has actually been included by the WHO on as part of their skin NTDs integrated strategy. So again, another um, opportunity there for a huge amount of collaborations, uh, perhaps pooling together funding and knowledge and so forth to, to tackle this um, major issue. So thank you for that, Chandra Kant. And also, before we delve into the discussions, um, a quick hello and also um, a reminder that was posted by Helen Price. Hello from Kiel University that um, the Eclipse project was uh, recently launched at the end of last year. And therefore, please, everyone, if you want to have some updates and hear more about it, head over to their Twitter feed, which is Eclipse underscore Kiel. Uh, but anyway, back to the presentation, Alvaro. Uh, just to start off, uh, a very brief question about whether you could just clarify uh, what between old world and new world. I think you had a slide with a map there that sort of described that. But this is a question from Bumkuth Mak. Much. I hope I've pronounced that properly. If you don't mind as well on the chat to let us know which uh, institution or university you're from, that would be uh, really great as well. So uh, that was a, a quick question from Bumkuth. Just uh, a very, very simple answer. Um, it just depends on the geographical region and and obviously uh, New World associated with America. So um, that's how people refer to New World Lishmanisis and Old World uh, basically everywhere else. And the the vectors, the main vectors in the in the Americas are the Luzum, different species of Luzomaya, whether it's in the, um, in the Old World, uh, there are many vectors, but it's mainly uh, flipotoma species. Thank you, brilliant. Um, a quick question here, looking at the treatment side of things, we had a couple questions from Helen Yankundi, uh, who is currently collecting data in two sites reporting cutaneous leishmaniasis cases. Um, both are applying different methods of treatment with SSG, intralesional and intravenous. And intravenous treatment has better results with less scarring. Based on your experience, is it possible to briefly share why this is the case and, in your opinion, what might be the best treatment? And Helen was also wondering about, um, in another question, uh, we observed the use of ice packs to reduce scarring. How effective is this? So a few uh, very words good, about Very good questions. I'm, 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 not, I'm not a physician, so uh, I can't really answer what the, uh, the efficacy of uh, intravenous. I think uh, different countries have different uh, policies regarding how they treat patients, okay, and they that has to do also in somehow um, in terms of uh, access to resources and treatment with SSG expensive. One bottle of uh, pentostam cost uh, around 100 US dollars. So uh, depends on the availability and, and the feasibility of that, then the patient there are different um, schools or way to address this. So um, um, this is all what is done in the kingdom uh, of Saudi Arabia, but in, in other areas and in the old world, um, there are some other um, uh, uh, approaches. And um, in some places, they don't um, 
use the first line of treatment as in Saudi Arabia. They just go straight into pentostam. And I think uh, um, there are some um, reasons for this, economic reasons. <clears throat> but uh, um, I would say that anything that we can do to spare the patients to go through this highly toxic and unpleasant secondary effects that antimony is producing in humans, that will be a great benefit. If it goes intravenous, um, I would say that this systemic treatment um, is, is, is probably uh, very effective, but you have to monitor very well the patient. In, in our experience, we know that they every time they go through different courses, they have to be monitored for liver and kidney function and, and so on. Um, so it's very unpleasant, and for um, the workforce itself, it's very difficult to be treated with this because um, the patient just is, is, is really, is on, it really discapacitates you to, to do any, any work. Um, then in terms of the cost, if the, um, uh, if the place is able to uh, afford all this uh, cost directly by, by just treating directly with, with antimonials, then um, um, although it's not the best uh, necessarily drug or, or the, or the uh, milder in terms of secondary effects, I think uh, that probably eliminated the problem quicker. So uh, that would be my uh, very um, uh, uh, naive answer for an, not a medical doctor. Very comprehensive nonetheless. And Helen has also added that intralesion injections are extremely painful, especially for children, which contributes to high default rates. Thank Absolutely you for right. your experience, Helen, and for sharing that. Um, we had a question here from uh, Andrea. Albuquerque went from Oxford University. Hey, Alvaro, two questions. Does dysbiosis have a different impact if it is caused by different species of bacteria? And are all the bacteria you are detecting in the skin microbiome pathogenic or commensal, non-pathogenic? And if so, could non-pathogenic bacteria be somehow used to control the growth of the most pathogenic ones? Cheers, yeah. great talk. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Andrea. This is a, a, a fantastic question. And, and starting from the last one, this is what we want to go to, whether we can uh, use in somehow um, that knowledge into, into modifying directly uh, the, the skin microbiome for treatment. Um, we, um, <clears throat> we have looked into some bacterial signatures uh, in relation to dysbiosis and severity. And, and that's in one of the, showed in one of the slides at the very end, we didn't have time to, to explain this much. I don't remember on top of my head the percentages in terms of making a correlation with that specific type of bacteria. But definitely um, the, the usual suspects are usually uh, Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, and Pseudomonas into this. So those are uh, infections that are very hard to treat uh, occasionally. We also did at some point, I didn't show that, um, the antibiograms in some of those samples, and we found a significant percentage of um, resistant to treatment to some of the antibiotics, which then is, a, is an added complexity into this. Uh, but once this uh, bacterial infection is clear, then for some reason, the patient becomes highly susceptible to, to antimonials. So, um, we haven't found any specific uh, resistance associated to a specific bacterial species. Uh, what we know is that once this, this biosis is more on the old, the diversity start to increase as a result of uh, antibiotic treatment or after that, then there is a better prognosis for the lesions to heal. Mm. Excellent. Um, Gert van der Awera from ITN Antwerp was asking um, uh, just a detail here. How old were the lesions? Were they the same age for both species? Good questions. Very uh, different. Um, yeah, <clears throat> it's very different because of to whatever is available at a given time in the different leishman analysis clinic, okay? And also, I mean, most people, we have to remember that most people, they look for medical treatment when the ulcer is becoming too noticeable or it becomes infected with secondary infection. The, the patient doesn't know this, but the, the, um, the ulcer is painless in most, most of the time. 
or when it's a stigmatizing because of then co-workers and, and saying that it's got um, something nasty that, that it could contaminate everyone, then the patient is, is sent to, uh, to the, one of those clinics. So we've got a diversity of different type of infections, okay? Um, also, let's remember that um, this money at Tropica is much harder to treat. So a lot of people, they're already been through several courses of uh, antimonials. So we can't really compare apples and pears with the two um, infection groups, basically. And just slightly following up on that, Derek Robinson, sorry, Derek Robinan was asking, um, does a secondary infection influence anti leishmanial drug access or influence function or immune response or does something else? Um, very good question. <clears throat> as, um, as part of the, this, this approach, what, what my understanding from what the, <clears throat> excuse me, the leishmaniasis doctor do in Saudi Arabia is that they just go straight and apply the first line of treatment uh, regardless of there is detectable secondary infection or not. And, and that's because there is a belief that um, uh, the antimonials won't work uh, if the secondary infections are not clear, regardless of the nature of that infection. So um, that's what they, they believe. We have not done any systematic studies into, into this, but um, that might be the case. Right, and it was Derek Robinson after all. Apparently, too many beers. <laughs> Someone's enjoying <laughs> lockdown. <laughs> um, great. A question from Gabriel Lang. Um, Gabriel saying, thanks for your talk. The, the epidemiology in relation to refugee camps was especially interesting. I'm a vet and we also see leishmania in dogs. If dogs can act as a reservoir of disease for humans, do populations or prevalence affect human disease control? Gabriel is with the SCI Foundation. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> dogs, and it depends on the region. So dogs are not normally the reservoir for uh, major infections, and it's mainly rodents, in the, at least in the Middle East. And dogs are the reservoir for Lishman Infanto normally, which will affect mainly children or the monocompromised people. So um, unless there have been a shift into oh, what would be the intermediate host, um, dogs, infected dogs, uh, shouldn't be a problem directly in, or is in relation to cutaneous leishmaniasis in those areas. But right. maybe in Europe, in some of the refugee camps, that might be relevant. Mm -hmm. um, a question here from Rueda Bakri. Hello, Rueda. Um, Rueda saying, thank you for your presentation. Did you find a diff any differences between male and female infection, treatment response, and microbiota types? And then kind of broadening the discussion a bit, uh, my colleague Cameron Rafiq was earlier also asking whether um, because of the stigma and the social issues you described, whether again there's a difference on that level between treatment of men and treatment of women. Well, a fascinating question. Uh, for cultural reasons, and it depends how uh, conservative the region on Saudi Arabia we we're dealing with, um, in, in our population, we have exclusively men, for example, in, in, in Al Hasa with all just uh, male workers. Uh, there, was, there wasn't a single female affected by, okay? Uh, whereas in Azir, it was different. There was, there, was, there was a significant higher population of female affected, mainly local Saudis. So um, <clears throat> we, on top of my head, I don't think that is, um, at least in Azir, there is uh, significant differences uh, in depending on, on the uh, gender. Um, and that has to do because uh, obviously a, a tropic infection is very difficult to treat anyway. So um, <clears throat> we can't really comment into an El major infection, as I said, because they were all mainly uh, affecting the migrant workers and male population. Uh, in terms of children, we only saw children infected in, in Azir again. And that's, and that's part of the, um, the, um, the, uh, the main challenges um, that people face. And that leads to this question of stigma, because obviously uh, the moms still protect the children for obvious reasons, they get stigmatized at school. Um, obviously, um, there might not be a future for, for, for a girl if you get a, a, a scarring on the face in terms of getting married, et cetera. So, so there are all sort of us, you know, social issues involved into, into these, this problem when it affects um, um, children. 
Absolutely. Um, Kamaladeen Benalal, hello Kamaladeen, um, is saying thank you for the nice presentation. What about the association of LRV and leishmania and microbiome in the healing process or its exacerbation? Uh, um, I believe it's referring to the virus and we haven't looked into that aspect. I think uh, um, the correlation with uh, a virus infection is, is, is mainly for some species or related to species involving in mucocutaneous leishmaniasis in, in, in South America. But uh, um, yes, there are some 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 leishmania uh, species that get some viruses in in, in the old world as well. Um, as far as I'm aware, there is no uh, study uh, suggesting that severity may increase because of the presence or the absence of those viruses. And just kind of um, going back to the One Health issues that were brought up by Gabriel uh, slightly earlier, Emmanuel Agunloye is from the Edman Center for Food and Health Research, uh, Ikari, Nigeria. And uh, Emmanuel was just commenting that um, uh, cattle and livestock tend to move unhindered across the Sahel and West Africa regions uh, without any quarantine or border posts and dogs um, tend to follow them as well. So this, this uh, explains uh, part of the problem. Uh, and this kind of ties back into a question that was asked um, earlier on. I've lost now. It was kind of towards the beginning of the of the talk by Stephen Bremer and Stephen was just asking, uh, Stephen works in pest and vector control, what efforts are directed at controlling the sand flies? Um, <clears throat> well, these uh, beyond what is being just uh, fogging and um, just, uh, <coughs> excuse me, spraying insecticides and just setting uh, traps, um, nothing else um, I can see that are major developments at least specifically for sand flies. Um, we particularly work in some other aspects of uh, vector control um, that um, appear to work also for uh, some flies. Um, but um, this is very much uh, the same approach uh, worldwide in terms of some fly control. Um, one problem that I have been seeing is an increase in insecticide resistance in some areas that have been seen in for uh, Phlebotomus gentipes, which is the vector of Lishmania, visual Lishmaniasis in India. And um, some colleagues um, at the School of Tropical Medicine, they, they have been working on that for some time. Um, I should say that vector control uh, in the absence of the vaccine is what probably uh, the best strategy in the short term to, to prevent um, outbreaks and to deal with outbreaks. And, but massive insecticide resistance had not been seen uh, worldwide, despite, you know, obviously they, they get uh, killed by parithroids and, and also the, the same insecticides that, that used to eliminate mosquitoes. And um, <clears throat> so um, the, but in terms of uh, novelty um, for vector control, um, uh, far as I know, there is not, not much around sugar bait seems to be um, uh, a good uh, strategy to go. Um, but the problem is the, the, the type of bait that is being used. They're not perfect. They don't, the attractant doesn't work as, as good as uh, people would like to. They, sometimes they leak. So if they got some toxin substances, then some uh, uh, other insects like ants and bees get also attracted to it. So um, uh, until that gets, uh, we get uh, access to a better uh, sugar bait, um, then that strategy won't be uh, very effective. Mm. And um, do you, would, you know, based on your experience, do you feel that the vector control sector could um, be more integrated into the whole disease control effort? Uh, are there, channels of partnership and communication that could be improved there? Um, yes, um, I think uh, um, one, one problem, of course, is, is the, uh, um, the community has not really advanced much in, in, in recent years. Uh, and, and I think uh, more than necessarily coming out with uh, a much better um, a strategy, it's just implementation of those strategies in different places and they're putting the resources in place for that to happen. Um, 
being a, an, a zoonosis in many cases, I would say that it would be very difficult to think about elimination of that disease. That's not the case, for example, for uh, anthropomorphic transmission in, in places like in India. But in, in terms of a zoonotic cycle, it's very difficult to think about that. So um, if we com come out with a, um, a, a, a complementary strategy where we have a very good uh, vector control, uh, active uh, surveillance, um, looking for patients, um, come out with better diagnostics, and a good campaign of information for both doctors and the local populations, I think uh, the problem of leishmaniasis would insist. Then even with all these uh, strategy in place, then there is sometimes a conflict. How can you do to, to implement this in a conflict situation? It's very difficult, it's impossible in many cases. Absolutely, and uh, as you were saying, uh, quite a large part of the increase in cases has been in war zones or in refugee camps, so um, again, a, a whole new set of challenges there. Thank you. Um, a question from Dennis Escobar. Uh, whilst trying to evaluate uh, the exposure to phlebotomine salivary, uh, is this made by a specific type of antibody like IgM? Um, we were looking into um, IgG responses. Uh, we didn't search for IgM. Um, I don't know if any, any, anyone from the Valenzuela lab uh, is in the audience uh, at the moment who can put a better response to this. But uh, <clears throat> in terms of the, the, um, the presence of those antibodies, um, they are clearly seasonal um, in many cases. Okay, it obviously depends on the region. And, and, but, um, <clears throat> and if definitely if the intervention um, is working, um, will definitely correlate later on with uh, um, a fall into the antibody titers uh, as well over time. Um, but no IgM as, as much as, as far as I remember. Sorry, wrong button there. Um, a question from Yaimi Lopez, who's tuning in from Guatemala and says, amazing talk. Does the microbiota of the sandfly also influence the response? Is this something you've been exploring? We, we, we looked into this and, and unfortunately, uh, towards the end of the talk, I had a couple of slides you know, mentioning this. And so Yasser, as part of his thesis, uh, he investigated this. Um, we don't know for uh, cutaneous leishmaniasis, but um, um, I wouldn't be surprised that uh, that would be the case. Uh, we need to do a lot of work um, in the lab now looking into potential bacterial species. Uh, having in consideration what I showed at the end, that the, that the microbiome of uh, colony flies is very different to what you can see in the field, okay? So um, um, we'll have to be extremely careful uh, to extrapolate to what may happen in the field. But that is, um, is a good question and something that we have discussed in the past. The reason why Yasser uh, looked into the sample and microbiota of the very same places, endemic places, where he uh, analyzed a sample from patients, uh, that was the reason, but we don't have any clear answers uh, into this. Okay, noted. And this uh, is also something that Ali Halajian was asking, uh, which is, is the microbiota of sandflies with parasite different from the sandflies that are not infected? Very good question. Uh, I don't know for Papatazzi, but there are, so I can refer you to some papers done by um, Mary Wilson and also by um, Shannon Kanghawi. Uh, they have looked into these in colony flies. So uh, um, um, this has been done already at least as far as I remember, within the infection, uh, looking into uh, Luzumaya, Longipalpis infection, and, um, and Lishmani infection. In fact, yeah, Lishmani infection, infection in Luzumaya, Longipalpis in, in the lab. Yeah. Right. Another question from Derek Robinson Is fexinidazole effective against tropical and major in the context of skin dysbiotic microbiota? Um, good question, because that's the magic drug for sleeping sickness these days. And, and 
I'm not sure. I think I've read something about it might be also uh, suitable for training Lichman ISIS, but uh, um, I don't remember, to be honest. Okay. Um, thank you. A question here from Mohamed Habib Jemli, um, which uh, has been asked in French, so I will try and translate as we go along. Uh, Alvaro, thank you for this excellent presentation. Uh, what are your thoughts on using a uh, the ointment uh, containing paromamycin associated to gentamicin against cutaneous leishmaniasis? Yeah, this is uh, uh, something that we wanted to get access to it. Um, um, when that paper in New England Journal came out um, comparing the two groups, uh, there seems to be uh, um, a, a very good uh, correlation, at least for treating um, infection of, uh, with L major. Um, <clears throat> we didn't have access to, to, to those drugs. Um, that's not what is being used in, in Saudi Arabia. Um, that would be anything that would be a topical application in principle, uh, from my point of view, would be much better than using um, antimonials, of course. And I'm not sure paramomycin will work to treat altropica. And um, I would say that the main challenge now, um, so even if we compare El Major with El Tropica, El Major um, you know, have multiple lesions and it could disseminate quicker, but I think the challenge is to find the drugs against Tropica. And, and because basically there isn't any, it's very hard to treat even with antimonials. And most of the uh, uh, dispersion in terms of uh, um, Lichmanasis caused in the Middle East is by Tropica, not necessarily major. Okay. So if paramomycin, for example, works in this particular case, it would be fantastic. Or anything topical that will deal with Tropica is very, very much needed these days. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Alvaro. We, I think we've, we've pretty much uh, tried to include all the questions, but there are a few more and a few more comments going on on the chat room. However, um, I think we're coming up towards the end of the time for our webinar. Um, you've had a huge amount of thank yous uh, from all corners of the world, Alvaro, uh, particularly Bernard Nafs summarized it very nicely saying, Alvaro, thanks a lot for your presentation. It may explain some of the observation that I have with Ethiopian leishmaniasis. So no doubt this has been um, uh, very informative and also very useful to, to hear more from your research. Um, perhaps in the last few minutes, Alvaro, we, we would like to ask you what would be your ideal next steps or what do you have in mind in terms of uh, following up on this research and building up on it? Or if there are any specific partnerships that you're looking for or um, collaborations? Yeah, we're looking into um, now with um, Yasser Array, Dr. Yasser Array coming back to the, to the kingdom and, and he's very much interested into uh, uh, pursuing this aspect. So um, I'm looking forward to expand my collaboration with him um, in a different capacity and and also with uh, any other uh, uh, <clears throat> person interested in the Middle East as well um, uh, to look into this. I'd be happy to, to consider the collaboration. I think uh, treatment responses is something, um, this aspect, I would love to know whether we can use bacteria signatures to predict, for example, severity uh, or responsive to um, to treatment, that will save a lot of time and resources, mm -hmm. and also um, will reduce <clears throat> the impact of scarring may have in some of these individuals. So I think uh, central for this treatment is important, uh, and diagnostic is also important as well. So those those are the two aspects in the into this research that I, I would love to continue on if I have the chance. Brilliant, thank you, that was noted. Um, I think the call has gone out there for anyone who's interested to get in touch. Alvaro, your contact details I believe are on the website of the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. So uh, we hope that these many conversations uh, will be ongoing and can continue. I'd just like to flag that on June the 15th, we will be holding our annual conference on vector-borne diseases and vector control. This is uh, what we call ISNTD Bites. It was going to be at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine and I always look forward to my 
annual visit to Liverpool because uh, I love that city and it's always a pleasure visiting LSTM. Unfortunately, it's not possible this year, so this will be an online event. Uh, therefore, please, by all means, um, do uh, go on our website, register for it. If you would like to speak or present anything at ISNTD Bytes, uh, definitely get in touch. This won't be on the Webinar Jam platform, but on a different uh, dedicated conference platform with a lot of opportunities <clears throat> for networking despite, um, despite the lockdowns and the social um, distancing. So that's June the 15th, ISNTD Bytes. Um, in the meantime, uh, I'd like to thank everybody who participated today. I think everyone will join me in thanking you, Alvaro, for your time uh, today, but also for your incredible and invaluable contribution to this field um, at all times. So a very, very warm and big thank you to you. Thank you for having me, and, and, and apologies again for all these technical issues. I'll, I'll have to work and do some homework for that, proving that to happen in the future. But anyway, uh, thanks thanks for the great questions, and, and happy to to engage more uh, via email if uh, anyone wants to uh, have some other questions. Thank you again for your time today. Okay. Thank you. Bye.